Welcome to The Hit Show, especially my loyal listeners in The Hit Squad. Here we talk about mastering hit, honesty, integrity, and transparency, and about investing in relational capital to create influence, and then how we wield that to create opportunities to make more money. We also talk about how this relates to a balanced life enterprise and more discretionary time to do the things that you love to do. My name is Stephen Cohen, and they call me the Hitman. And practically, I'm showing you how to reach a better quality of life. This is why I interview the people that I do, because they have it. And they can show it to you, and you can learn it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Hit Show. There you are. Yes, times are tough. Times are strange. But we got to drive on with the business. We have to keep doing what we're doing and re- discover what we're really all about. And I got a story today with you, with, with, uh, uh, with our newest guest, Nathan Hirsch, who had to recently re- rediscover himself as well. Quite successful in what he does, had, had a downturn and had to recover it himself. And let me tell you a little bit about Nathan. He's an entrepreneur and expert in remote hiring and e-commerce. Most recently, he co-founded freeup.com. In 2015, with an initial $5,000 investment and scared to scale to 12 million per year in revenue, and was then acquired in 2019. Today, he is the co-founder of Outsource School, a company working to educate entrepreneurs on how to effectively hire and scale with virtual assistance through its in-depth courses. He's appeared on 300 plus podcasts, now 301, in social media personality, is a social media personality, and loves sharing advice and scaling remote businesses. Hit Squad, welcome Nathan Harris to the show. How you doing, brother? Dude, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, uh, awesome. So let's, let's, let's jump right in. What are you doing right now in the middle of this crisis or whatever you want to call it to, to sort of adapt or rediscover who you are? Yeah. I mean, I, my life is kind of not changed that much. I work remote. I've been working remote for five to seven years now. So outside of not being able to go to the gym and all that, um, I mean, I, I think that we're all kind of going towards remote working, remote hiring anyway. And this whole thing is kind of just accelerating the process. So right. when I, I sold free up, obviously I had no idea that this was going to happen, um, but I sold free up to an awesome group of people that are going to take it. And although I'm sure all businesses are struggling right now, I think they're in a, a great place for after this is over, more people are going to be hiring remote. And now we're launching Outsource School, which is kind of in the, the similar boat. So we're not offering VAs or freelancers, but we're offering education on how we built a team of 35 VAs that ran a $12 million company with no US employees, no office, how we interview, onboarded, train them and manage them. And probably not the best week to, to launch a business. We launched last week, although we had a pretty good first week. Um, but we think that it, it becomes even more relevant as right. we go forward. Um, people have to utilize things like virtual assistants to grow their business. So what exactly does the, does the new business do? It's, the it, platform is for education to teach us how to, how to hire virtual assistants to scale our company. Yeah. So there's two sides of it. There's the core side and there's the software side. So on the software side, we're working on a bunch of cool toolboxes for VAs. Our first software is an SOP builder, standard operating procedure. So it makes you e- makes it easy for you to build very dynamic SOPs for your business and give it to VAs. And the second side of it is the courses. We just launched our first course called Cracking the VA Code. So that's our exact process for interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing. And that's for sale now for, for nine ninety seven. And then we're launching a new course coming out right now. I, you mentioned I've been on a lot of podcasts. Right. Um, it, it's all about how to use a virtual assistant to get on more podcasts, to do research. It's called the Podcast Outreach Formula. So we're excited for that too. And we're going to keep coming out with different courses, how to use a VA for social media, how to use a VA to Great. keep your inbox clear, stuff like that. And what is it? Is it a subscription every month? Is it a course? What's the, how's it work? Right now, it's a course. The software is a subscription part of it. Okay, great. So, all right, let's um, let's let's talk about uh, how you went from that five grand to um, what was it? Uh, five grand to twelve million annual revenue. Yeah. So before that, I was selling on Amazon, and I had some success there. And and at the beginning, I thought I was going to take down Amazon, take down the world. And although I made a good amount of sales there, it wasn't something that was scalable long term. If you've ever sold on Amazon, you're not really growing your brand. We were drop shipping for other manufacturers at the beginning. It was me and a handful of sellers. Competition got harder. Um, people, the courses, the gurus, and all that stuff came out. So Amazon became harder. Instead of doing doubling every single year, we were kind of stuck in that two to four million dollar mark. And we had hired virtual assistants to build that Amazon business, and we had a lot of success. 
we hated the Upworks, we hated the fibers of the world, and we kept looking for something better, something faster. And when we couldn't find it, we said, you know what, we're going to go out there and build it ourselves. So we spent $5,000 on this very basic software, um, minimum viable product, it did very little, freelancers could clock in and clock out, clients could see their freelancers, and that was it. And we had built this Rolodex of VAs that we could rely on from our Amazon business. And we went to Amazon sellers to start and we eventually spent expanded other markets. But we said, Hey, we've got these awesome people. We've already vetted them. If anything goes wrong, 24 seven support we will cover any replacement costs if they quit. And whenever you need something, you just email us, Skype us, put in a request eventually in our software, you get someone quickly. You can get started right away. And People like this. They like the protection. They like the speed. They like the pre-vetting. And, and that business started to scale. And we really use organic marketing to, to grow the business, a combination of a referral program, networking, being on podcasts, putting out content, doing a lot of different content swaps with other partners, and getting micro-influencers to promote us. And that's really how we're able to grow organically. And we can dive more into that if you want. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to dive into the micro influencers. Everyone talks about influencers, micro influencers, marketing. They help you with this stuff, but I've, you know, I've I've personally never met anyone who actually had much success with that in a big way. So tell us about that. Yeah, so everyone wants to work with like the Russell Brunson in the world and the right. Gary V's and stuff right. like that. To me, like that's great. If you land them, you can get, reach out to them and all that. But I'm focused on people that have small communities of people that are my target audience. They might have a podcast. They might have a Facebook group. They might be a coach and, and their students are, are perfect for your business. And it, does, it can be any business. If you right. sell um, supplies for a bar, let's say you sell cups, you should find communities of drinkers, of, of bar meetups and stuff like that. And you should network with the owners of those groups and see if there's a way to mutually add value. If you have a podcast, maybe you have them on yours. If you have a blog, let them guest post and backlink, blast out their offers to your audience and, and vice versa. They'll do the same. And the, the key here is you have to portray that you're going to take really good care of their community if they go with you because they're kind of like the gatekeepers, right? They, they don't want to let in anything that's going to hurt their community. And it's not always easy. I've had times where I had to go in and find people that were already in their community that I'd use free up and get their testimonials and send it to them. I had times where I didn't get aggressive or angry or frustrated the first time I was rejected and I kept following up and reaching out and eventually those opportunities come and you have to be okay with that rejection and that failure. Right. But it's one of the best ways to to really grow your business organically when you have all these different partners, all these different micro influencers that you have real relationships with that will promote your business, recommend so, your business over and over. You're talking about collaborations with, with mailing lists. It could be mailing lists. It could be podcasts. Posts, it could be blogs. Yeah, posts, it could be YouTube yeah. videos. Yeah. Uh, it could just okay. be a micro influencer yeah. that likes you that yeah. goes live on Facebook and talks about your business. Yeah. We're launching our book um, uh, as we speak, uh, unleash your humble alpha. We're doing a crowdsourcing campaign with our own crowdsourcing platform through WordPress instead of using the big names, you know, Kickstarter and Indiegogo and stuff, because they keep 10%, then they keep 5% longer, and then you get, you get the money six weeks after that kind of stuff. So we decided to do it ourselves, and we just, we, we ran with that. So we, we, we had a referral campaign where people can sign up uh, and mail their list, and they get points for as many people that opt in, and then they win prizes, and stuff like that. So we did it. We went down that route. Actually just wrote another 20 mails to the people that uh, haven't sent their mail yet, their third mail yet. So we're just checking in on them, you know. I, I know it's a strange time to be pushing sales. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, so we were we were all ready to go with a, a big pre-sale. So our course is nine ninety seven. For the first week, we did it at four ninety seven, and we had a hundred influencers ready to go. We Connor, my, my business partner, and I were hustlers. We're out there talking to people and all that, and and then Corona obviously hit. So we we kind of took the approach that they, there, there's no like perfect formula, right? If we had just shut it down, there were people that wanted to buy the course. Right. They would have been upset with us. So we we tried to please everyone. We we, we send a message out to our affiliates to first of all, please don't use Corona. Or don't use anything that's going on in the world to push our product. Don't use fear tactics or anything like that. We don't want our brand associated with that. And second, if they don't feel comfortable pushing now, which a lot of affiliates didn't, we totally understand that. We respect it. We don't want them to feel like they have to because they committed right. to being affiliate and our stuff's evergreen anyway. So we're much more focused on a, a long-term business than a short-term. And then from our side, we kind of did a, a softer launch. We kind of took our, our foot off the metal. Again, not using Corona, not mentioning it in any of our sales copy, um, probably sending a few less emails than we normally would, a few yeah. less lighter social media posts and 
we still sold over, over 80 in the first week. So whether we would have sold 200 or whatever, who knows, but we, we feel like we, we kind of handled it in a, as, in a, as professional way as we possibly could. Cause I don't think that the world should just expect all businesses to close down ones that don't necessarily have to close down during these times. Yeah, I know people are, Oh, it's predatory and things like that. But what, what I see is just, I mean, I, I know a guy in the fitness space made hundred K in one day, you know, it's just uh, from his fitness course and because people are like home bored uh, or, you know, thinking they have to do something. And this is the thing about it is I think it's a perfect time to learn things like what you're teaching because you know, you can go home and say, okay, I'm going to wait for my life to continue again. And I'm going to watch TV and get and eat chips and get fat or whatever. Um, you can do that, but you're going to get lethargic real quick and negative and depressed really quick. And I, I, it's a, it's a perfect time to a rediscover yourself and B rediscover that what you were doing the whole time you didn't like anyway. And this is, this is it. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I just had this, um, I was talking to oil and gas industry guys that I work with and uh, you know, they're senior VPs and they work operations. So they have all these plants and all these um, rigs and stuff that they staff. And one of the rigs they had to shut down. So they deferred all these guys. I don't know. It was like 80 guys. And they offered them, Hey, two and a half miles away is another rig. You can go work there or we have to furlough you and you have to go home with no pay. One guy went to the other rig, 79 went, no, no, we're good. We want to go home. Wow. You know, that's how much people hate their jobs, but they don't realize it until they say, you know what? I can actually, I don't actually have to do this. Matter of fact, now I can't even do it. So this is a time to actually just dig deep and see who you are. And once you see who you are, you learn, you, you, you do that by trying different things and, and uh, experimenting and keeping that frontal lobe active. So something like you're doing as far as uh, teaching somebody something, I think it's, it's actually the perfect timing, just like our book is perfect timing as well. Yeah, I agree. And if you're an entrepreneur out there and maybe your revenue has gone down a little bit or whatever it is, use this time to regroup, to build, to get more organized, to focus on the back end of your business and fixing all that up and let that catch up. Because a lot of times I kind of compare it to a car. You're driving, you're driving, and sometimes you need to pull off the road to, to change your tire or fix something in the car. But a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't really have a downtime to do that because it's yeah. always go, 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 go. And this is the perfect opportunity to fix what's not working in your business, to build new products, to, to really reorganize. And I feel like people should be taking advantage of that opportunity. I know that's what we're doing. We're buckled down. We're creating yeah. new courses, new content, working on our software so that when this passes and hopefully it'll pass sooner than we think, we're ready to go and we have everything built. Awesome. Uh, that sounds like it sounds, it sounds like you're right on time there. So um, let's let's see what your future plans are. What are you gonna? What's what's your plan with this one? You're gonna do an exit again, or you want to grow this to something different? Or yeah, I mean, with free up, we never really plan an exit. I mean, we're a logical person. So we're logical people. So there's only so many things you do with the business, right? You either right. run it forever, you run it into the ground, you get investors, which I personally don't want to do. I don't want to feel like I'm working for someone else, right. or you sell the business. So. We, we, pro we mentally don't spend any time trying to find people to buy the business. If someone comes across with an offer, which is what happened, we're willing to, to listen to it. But I also think we're, we're a little too early. We just launched last week. Of course, we want to sell more businesses and grow more businesses, but right. much more focused on just serving our customer base and providing good value. And the rest of the stuff takes care of yourself. Awesome. Awesome. So what, what about um, um, where you came from? I mean, wh you started where? Where are you from? What have you done? Yeah, so I grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, my parents were both teachers growing up. So I, I always had the mentality that I was going to go to school, get a real job, uh, work for 30 years, retire. And I went to Quinnipiac University. I, I actually have a college degree up here that I've never used. And uh, yeah, so but before, I got one of those. <laughs> <laughs> before I got to college, my parents always made me work these 40, 50 hour week jobs every summer, every winter, every vacation. And I, I learned so much about like sales and marketing and business and working with people. But I also learned how much I hated having a boss. I was yeah. watching the clock every single day. So I kind of got a glimpse of, of what like life was like after college. And I want to know part of it. So when I got to college, I looked at it as a ticking clock. I had four years to start my own business. And I started hustling. I started competing with my school bookstore and buying people's textbooks and selling them online. And uh, eventually got a cease and desist letter from yeah. my college telling me to say. knock it off. <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool. Um, so you actually, when you were in college, you actually said I have four years to start a business or is that just something that crystallized later? 
No, I did. I went into it. And I obviously you have doubts when you go into college. Yeah. You're like, is this the right path? What am I doing? And I remember, I, so I went to school for business, just generic, and I had to pick a major. And they had all the business teachers go up and talk for 30 seconds or two minutes and, and pitch finance, pitch economics, whatever. And the entrepreneur program was brand new. And the new economic dean or professor went up there and she said, if you ever want financial freedom, if you ever want life freedom, the only way to do it is to become an entrepreneur. And then she just walked off stage and that was it. And in oh, my mind, I'm like, good. oh my God, that's right. That's exactly what I want. And, yeah. and after that, I was like reinforced that this is the way I want to go. And did all the other professors, were they all upset because she said that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, like I have friends that, that love being accountants and that's what they want to do. They love yeah. the stability. Yeah. Like even now they still have a job. They're working from home and they, they don't want to be entrepreneurs. They don't want to yeah. take risks. They, they yeah. like that. So I think it, it takes a certain type of person to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Where did that, where did that risk turn into freedom? You know, cause, mm-hmm. cause uh, many people see, you know, the hard part is leaving a secure paycheck to become an entrepreneur. But when you're, when you have nothing and you become an entrepreneur, it's a little bit different. So when did that risk turn into freedom for you? When did you feel that click? And I'll also add that I had the mentality, and again, I'm a very logical person, that I was young. I was in college. It's time to take risks. If I start a bunch of businesses and they fail, I, I'm going to get a degree in my back pocket. I, I can always go out and get a real job. So I think it would have been different there. Um, I mean, I, I was very fortunate. I had a, a lot of success with my Amazon business. I think by year two, I was making more that, than my parents, but it probably wasn't until like the, the free up exit that I, I purely have financial freedom or life freedom. Um, but it, I'm also just a pretty frugal person. Like I don't go out there and buy Jaguars. Like that's not really my style. I pretty much spend money on, on travel and food and I can't even travel right now. So um, not, not much I can do there, but I, I'm much more about activities and learning and um, experiences that, that I am about buying actual stuff, which I think yeah, plays into right. to long-term wealth. So what, what, what do you think about social responsibility in times like this for, for, for companies that are actually out there making money when so many aren't? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone needs to, to find a way to, to give back in their own way. I think you've seen some of the bigger companies that can make ventilators, stuff like that. Like, that's great. I think smaller businesses have a role too. Even if they're not directly making medical products, they have they have people that they employ. They have vendors that they pay. They, they keep the economy going. So I think the worst thing that everyone can do is just shut down their businesses for three months and wait. We need to keep the economy going as much as possible. But I think businesses should, should also have social responsibility, always have social responsibility. I mean, with outdoor school, we donate per, a percentage of all our sales to Teach for the Philippines, which is a, a great organization we love that t- brings education to Filipino children because we've been big in the VA space. We've been big in the Filipino VA space. We didn't want to just sell free up and be like, all right, guys, talk to you yeah, later. Right. Uh, we wanted to, to stay a part of that. So. I think everyone has to, to give back in their own ways, whether it's a charity, whether it's actually making the devices that help people, whether it's supporting the economy or finding a different way to just help other things like climate change that are, these are problems now, but there's also problems down the line that everyone right. needs to be aware of. Right. Well, it's, it's a great attitude. And, and you, guys are, you guys are active in that since you started back uh, 2015. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all about not getting to the top by ourselves. So we had VAs who helped us grow free up the entire time. And, and these were people that, that at the beginning took a low rate. Their rate went up as the business grew. Um, we made sure that they wouldn't get screwed over in the sale. If they were going to lose their jobs, we weren't going through with it. We took $500,000 from a sale and gave it to our team in the Philippines to thank them and reward them. And by far the toughest part of not working with free up is not working with our team, our friends yeah, anymore, yeah. but we still feel like it was a win-win for everyone. One of those tough business decisions you have to make for, for everyone's good. And it's stuff like that that I think entrepreneurs need to take seriously, that it can't just be you getting the top and everyone else down here. You have to find a way that, that all the people that help you, because no yeah, one gets it to the right. top by themselves, yeah. that they get rewarded and they get benefited from it as well. What was the, what was the impact of sharing a 500 grand with how, however many employees you had in the Philippines? That's a lot of money over there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it was good. People were able to pay off their debts. People were able to add 
like new roofs to their house. I know my, my VA that I've worked with for eight years, Chicky Ann, I'm, I'm the godfather of one of her kids. And um, we visited her house a, a few years ago and she told us she wanted to renovate it and make it a better place to live. So she was able to do that. Um, we kind of taught them a little bit about investing and saving up. And I kind of told them that, hey, like I, I don't want to talk to you in five years. And although I'm talking to them frequently anyway, yeah. and, and hear that you're broke and you blew through all the money. Like I want you to, to take this as an opportunity to invest it, save it and, and make something of it so that going forward, you're in a better place. And, uh, hopefully, and it's up to them that they make the most of it. And is she, I, I think so, so far. So, um, I mean, I, I touch base with her all the time. She seems to be doing well as well as anyone can do in the, in the current yeah. climate right now. Wow. That's a trip. I, I see that's, that's the kind of stories you don't hear about. You always hear about the big stories, the big, you know, the big, oh, we donated a million dollars here. We did that or this big movement or that kind of thing. So to hear the single stories like that are really interesting. I mean, that's where the impact is. You know, I think a story like that, I'd, I'd like to see a story like that on, on someone's website. This is, this is so-and-so, we helped them, this is what they did, this is their, you know, took care of their house and yada, 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 something like that. That's for, and that makes people say, okay, they're getting down to the grain. Because it's one thing to say, I wanna donate a million bucks to you know, the March of Dimes who literally only pays a dime for a charity and the rest is marching right to their pockets for administrative costs. That's why it's called the March of Dimes. Um, and, uh, or, or you can actually implement it yourself and go there and make it happen like, like, like you did. So kudos, brother. That's, that's really, really awesome. Uh, so we're winding down now to the end. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that you can watch this on YouTube as well. So it's Stephen, uh, uh, sorry, it's youtube.com slash Stephen Eugene Kuhn and check it out. You can watch us smiling and, uh, and, and uh, talking to each other instead of just listening to us. But before we, we roll out, tell us where people can find you, what your actual offer is. You said uh, you had an offer last week, this week it's back up or what's the deal? Yeah. So anyone can connect with me on social media, um, Nathan Hirsch on Facebook and LinkedIn, the real Nate Hirsch on Instagram and Twitter. I'm probably one of the easiest entrepreneurs to reach out to. And if I can help you in any way during these tough times, please reach out to me. Um, definitely check out Outsource School. Join our newsletter. If you haven't already, we have a free VA calculator for you that helps you um, figure out how many VAs you can afford right now. It's a cool little tool. And we're offering the course at $9.97 going forward. Um, but if you do sign up and mention this podcast, we'll give you a $100 free up credit. So free up is a marketplace to get VAs. So you can not only get the course, but you can take that credit and start hiring VAs. And we're there to, to help you along the process. And the last thing I'll add is the cool thing about the course is you can kind of go through hiring a VA as you take it. You can learn our interview process, go interview, learn our onboard, go onboard. And right. if you have questions along the way, you can reach out to us. So hopefully we can help a lot of people transition their business to being more remote, more reliable, more stable uh, going forward. Excellent. And so that's outsourceschool.com. Yep. All right. All right, Nathan, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Any parting words for those people out there that are worried and scared and wondering what to do right now? What's your last word of power? Yeah, communication is key right now, especially if you have a team, if you have VAs, if you have freelancers, employees, whatever it is, let them know how busy your business is doing, good or bad. Be open, be honest with them. Come up with creative solutions. I mean, my gym is shut right now. They can't make their membership money, but they're doing a live stream for $20 a month and they're rallying their community. It takes a little bit of creativity. It takes strong communication. If you need to cut someone's hours or you need to lower their rate, be honest with them. Try to give them different options. Yep. Try to support them in any way you can. Refer them to other people. Post on social media. Someone else might be hiring. Um, give them referral letters. Whatever it takes to help and support them and, and really just communicate. I can't stress that enough. Don't make it a secret how your business is doing right now. Excellent advice. Thank you so much uh, for being on the show. The Hit Squad really appreciates it, as do I. And for everyone else, like I said, follow us on, on YouTube, social media. Go ahead and give a shout out to Nathan on his pages. You'll find it in the show notes below. And remember that one thing that we always talk about. It's all about quality of life. See you next time.